Well, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. We're going to continue our study in the book of Ephesians. You're talking about a mystery this morning. How many of you, you like a good mystery, a good mystery story? I remember when I was a kid, um, they had these mystery books uh, called the Hardy Boys. Anybody, anybody remember those? Yeah, some of you remember those. Um, I remember mom would take us to the library and they had all these Hardy Boy books and we'd check out these Hardy Boy books. Of course, my sisters uh, read the Nancy Drew books, right? And, uh, but a good mystery, you know, a good plot where it would um, kind of keep you in the dark until one of the last pages and then finally the mystery the mystery would uh, be revealed. Um, you know, if you like movies, a good movie is the one that has a good plot, a good mystery to it. And, and you, uh, you're all through the movie, you're wondering, will the good guys win? Will the bad guys win? Who's the real villain in this movie? And finally, it's revealed right at the end. Now, in our passage today, four times, Paul uses the word mystery. The word mystery. You know, what is a mystery? Well, it's... Um, Something difficult or impossible to understand. You know, I think God is the best mystery writer in, of, of all time. You know, the Bible is written in such a way that an unbeliever who's reading the Bible has a really hard time understanding it. Um, we need the help of the Holy Spirit to, to really understand it. When a, but when a person comes to be a believer, they put their faith in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes into their life and helps them understand the writings which the Holy Spirit wrote in the first place. And it's amazing to watch someone after they become a believer and all of a sudden they have the Holy Spirit in their life and, and all of a sudden they start picking up their Bible and they start reading it like, wow, this is amazing. And all of a sudden they start understanding it because the mystery has been revealed. Now if we go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, we notice that Paul is in prison. He says, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. He, Paul considered himself to be a prisoner of war, really. He, was, um, he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, now that's not exactly health and wealth preaching, is it? It's not exactly like uh, you hear a lot of the, the famous TV preachers uh, preaching. You know, uh, was there sin in Paul's life? Is that why he was in prison? Was, there because, was he there because he had a lack of faith? I don't think so. He was there for a specific purpose. Christ allowed him to be there. Christ wanted him to be there. Um, you know, he didn't say, I'm a prisoner of Rome or I'm a prisoner of a bunch of heathens. He said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So Jesus wanted him in prison? You know, God isn't as concerned about our happiness as he is about our holiness. God isn't as concerned about your comfort as he is about your effectiveness. And Paul was very effective while he was in prison. He wrote all these letters while he was in prison. He was very effective while he was in prison. Now, before we start in chapter 3, let's recap a little bit the last couple of verses in chapter 2. When he's talking about the church, all right? He's talking about the church. He says, verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, Paul is about to embark on some very, very important teachings about the church. But he first wanted to establish the importance of, of recognizing the significance of the temple and comparing that to the church. Now, notice some components that he uses here in this passage of Scripture. He talks about the foundation, the foundation uh, of the apostles and the prophets, okay, which Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's comparing this to Solomon's temple, all right? Solomon's temple, we know, was a beautiful temple, probably the most beautiful temple, uh, most beautiful building ever built overlaid with gold and bronze, so much bronze they couldn't even count it all, it says. And uh, the, um, the wood was cedars imported from Lebanon and all carved and overlaid with gold. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing to behold. But why all the detail? 
because it was the house of God. Because it was the house of God. And at the dedication of the temple, the presence of God came down into that house of God. But now he compares the church to that building. He says, Christ is the cornerstone. The apostles are the foundation. And he says, all of us are the building blocks. The building blocks. Now, what do we know about the building blocks? Well, we know that they were cut in a quarry far away from where the temple was. Um, 1 Kings 6, 7 tells us, In building the temple, only blocks dressed at the quarry were used, and no hammer, chisel, or any other iron tool was heard at the temple site while it was being built. Now, why is that significant? Because that's a foreshadowing of the church. We are the building blocks, it says, of this temple, the church. And many of us, you know, we came from far away from the church, and we become believers, and we're brought into the church, and we're made perfect before we, when we're put into that, into that position. Now, not that we're um, in the sense that we don't have any flaws in us, uh, but we're made perfect when we believe in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10, 13 says, Because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. See, only the building blocks that were perfectly fitted to fit into that temple could be brought in and be fitted in that temple building. In the same way, we as believers are made perfect in Jesus Christ and brought in and become a part of that church. When God looks at us, he sees perfect blocks because of Jesus Christ. We're made perfect in Christ. And of course, Jesus, the cornerstone. That's why we called our church Solid Rock Chapel. We're built on the rock of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. So everything that we do needs to be checked by that cornerstone. We ask, what would Jesus do? WWJD. What did Jesus teach on this subject? Now, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the basis for all truth. So every decision must be checked through that paradigm. Okay, so as we come to chapter 3, It's really a prayer that Paul's uh, beginning to pray, but there's kind of a parenthesis from verse 2 through verse 13, where he says, uh, oh, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, you know, about this. And as we go through this, if you would, would you just underline the word mystery when we come to it in your Bible? Just underline the word mystery as we come through it. And if you're using one of the pew Bibles here, one of the the church's Bibles, I I checked with the elders, and it's fine for you to write in that, all right? It's fine. Okay. Okay. Let's just read from verse 2 through verse 13. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, and he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Okay, the mystery. First of all, several things about the mystery. If you've got your notes, the mystery was hidden. It was hidden. It was a hidden, a secret thing, not obvious to the understanding. 
Colossians 1.26 says, The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. Can you imagine for hundreds of years, the Jewish people had the Old Testament. They had the writings of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, of, um, of Moses, of the other prophets, and they could read those. But can you imagine reading some things that just absolutely didn't make sense? Like reading in Isaiah, where it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. That would have made no sense if you didn't know about the crucifixion, if you didn't know about Jesus Christ. I mean, crucifixion wasn't even invented yet by the Romans. That would not have made any sense at all. That's why we find in... Uh, in the book of Acts where Philip was going along, and there's this Ethiopian going along, and he's reading Isaiah, it says. And Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he was reading Isaiah chapter 53, and he says, no, how can I understand this? I, it's, unless somebody explains it to him. And it says, Philip crawled up in the chariot, and he rode with him, and he explained to him Jesus, the mystery that Brought, it, brought the whole puzzle together was Jesus, the mystery revealed. You know, we can see that happening today as we think of, as we study end times prophecy. And through ages past, some of those prophecies didn't make any sense. When we think of things like um, uh, the prophecies about you know, this great war that's going to happen in the end times. Imagine reading that a hundred years ago before these massive weapons were developed. It wouldn't have made any sense. But now, as we read those, it does make sense, especially because of what happened last week and even this morning when Russia unveiled a nuclear missile that flies ten times the speed of sound 7,000 miles per hour, and this morning they released a video that, that showed them testing this weapon. It flies 7,000 miles per hour, equipped with a nuclear warhead, can be anywhere in the world in a very short period of time, and can destroy a city or a nation, just like that. When we read in Revelation where, and in Isaiah where a city is destroyed in one hour, a nation is destroyed in one hour. That wouldn't have made any sense years ago. But today, it definitely does make sense when the Bible says that if it weren't for those days being shortened, the whole world would be destroyed. But God intervenes and shortens those days. So that mystery is being revealed. And it was just the same way for them. When Jesus came, He exposed the mystery. Now all of a sudden, things started making sense. Uh, the second thing I want you to notice this morning is Paul was excited about this mystery. Have you ever had one of those light bulb moments when something that was a mystery to you suddenly makes sense and you get excited and you, you, feel, you feel disappointed that others aren't as excited about it as you are? Um, I think that's kind of how Paul felt. When he, all of a sudden, he had this light bulb moment on the road to Damascus, and he's trying to get everybody else as excited about it as he is, and, you know, it's probably like it is today. Some people are like, oh, oh, um, <laughs> you know, so what? Big deal. He says in Romans chapter 16, he says, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known to the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and obey Him. I think, I think Paul just couldn't fathom why not everyone would believe in Jesus Christ. He was so excited about it. He just couldn't understand why people wouldn't, wouldn't believe in Him. He says all nations might believe and obey him. In 1798, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, there was a lot of things they didn't understand about the Egyptian culture. 
Uh, now, Napoleon's hobby was archaeology. And so when he went into Egypt, he brought some archaeologists with him. And they started doing some digging. And they discovered a huge stone. A huge stone with a lot of writing on it. The writings on the stone unlocked the secrets of the ancient Egyptian language, the hieroglyphics that they saw everywhere. And they were close to the town of Rosetta, so they called it the Rosetta Stone. You may have heard of it. There's a company today that sells uh, programs where, called Rosetta Stone where you can learn different languages and so forth. But that Rosetta Stone unlocked the key for the Egyptian language. Jesus is the Rosetta Stone. Now that he has come, all the prophecies make sense. See, when Paul understood the mystery that the Gentiles were included in God's plan, he couldn't, he couldn't contain himself. He wanted to shout it from the uh, tops, mountaintops. He told everyone. He even told the, the jailers, the people that, he was, that were holding him in prison, um, I don't know if this is true or not, but legend has it that, that the jailers kept getting saved, and so they had to keep changing them all the time and had to keep bringing new, new, new jailers to him because he kept getting them saved and, all the time. He had good news. He was excited about the good news. There's a new movie coming out. I don't know if you've seen anything on it coming out March the 23rd called Paul, the Apostle of Christ. And uh, I think it would be a, a good one probably to go see, but it. It's, it's about Paul's life. Um, be interesting to see. You know, what if you had the cure for cancer? You know, cancer is a mystery. They don't really know what causes it. They don't know how to cure it. Uh, you know, they've made a lot of progress, but they still don't know how to cure it. But what if you had the answer? Wouldn't you be excited, be enthused for that? Well, we've got something way better than that. We've got the cure. The cure. For eternal death we've got eternal life we've got the good news of the gospel now i'm sure there were people around paul telling paul you just need to tone it down a little bit kind of chill out a little bit just back off a little bit um just kind of chill out but paul didn't he stood up bold and strong and he wound up in prison now even our day it's increasingly hazardous to stand up and say what you believe in, what you stand for. A few weeks ago, Mike Huckabee was asked to serve on the board of the CMA, the Country Music Association. He's always been a, a music lover and uh, been a music fan, and so they asked him to serve on the board. Uh, you know, you don't get any more American than country music, do you? And uh, this, he thought, well, that would be good. He accepted the accepted the um, invitation. Mike is a former pastor. He's the former Arkansas governor. He was a presidential can candidate. His appointment to the Country Music Association lasted for one day because there was enough backlash from people because of his stand on biblical marriage that in one day they asked him to step back down. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? All because Mike's stance that marriage is between a man and a woman. So we do have some of that going on here today in our country. The third thing I want to point out this morning is that the mystery was opened up to everyone. It was opened up to everyone. In verse, verse 9, it says, And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. It's opened up to everyone. But I want you to notice Paul's humility in verse 8. He says, although I am less than the least of all of God's people. Even though Paul was well-educated, Paul was um, well-traveled, Paul had done a lot of things, he'd planted a lot of churches, he was a very humble person. We can kind of track his humility as he goes throughout his life. In, um, when he wrote 1 Corinthians, which would have been about A.D. 59, Paul says, for I am the least of the apostles. In A.D. 64, about five years later in Ephesians 3.8, 
he says, I'm less than the least of all God's people. In 1 Timothy 1.15, which would have been in AD 65, he says, I am the chief of sinners. We can kind of see the digression. It looks like as he gets closer to Christ, he keeps thinking less and less of himself. And isn't that what the Bible teaches? Thinking more of Christ and less and less of ourselves. He says, even I, I'm the least of all. But I've got this figured out. Everyone has access. Everyone has access. But some people just don't get it, do they? Uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty three says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. You know, a stumbling block. A stumbling block for the Jews because they just couldn't, couldn't quite get over the fact that they were God's chosen people and that God opened this up for everyone. They just couldn't quite grasp that, couldn't quite understand that. And foolishness for the Gentiles. You know, the mystery of the gospel is still foolishness to many today. It's always amazing to me that some of the smartest minds in the world just can't seem to grasp the truth of God's Word. And yet some of the, the simplest people in the world, some of the most unju- uneducated people in the world can understand it freely. Isn't that what Jesus said would happen in Luke ten twenty one, When he's praying to his Father and he says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them unto little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Who did Jesus, Jesus choose as his disciples? He chose fishermen. He chose the uneducated. He chose um, men who didn't think they knew it all. Men who were teachable and trainable. That's who Jesus chose to be his disciples. You know, I just want to tell you, parents, put the, be careful when you send your kids off to college. Be careful. Be sure they're ready for that. Our colleges are filled with so much garbage and they're made to feel stupid if they don't go along with all the liberal theology in in the colleges. Um, Be careful. I'm not against higher education, not at all. But be careful. See, Paul's mission was to unpack this great mystery for everyone. Jew or Gentile, it didn't matter. Here's the fourth thing about the mystery. The mystery entrusted to the church. The mystery is entrusted to the church. Verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. What is, what is a church anyway? What is a church Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. The church is wherever there's a group of believers meeting together in common unity. The church is wherever there's a group of believers meeting together in common unity. It might be a small group meeting. It might be a huge um, meeting. See, the church is not a building. It's people. It's people. And his intent, was the mystery of the church would be revealed, mystery of the gospel would be revealed through the church. And then he says something very interesting in this verse. He says that it might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. What? According to that verse, we're teaching Rulers, who are the rulers and authorities? They're the angels and demons in the heavenly, heavenly realm. We're teaching them. God is using the church as an illustration to the people in the heavenly realm. We're the, we're the classroom. They are God's, in God's classroom, God's a teacher. The angels are the students and the church is the illustration. That's amazing to me. That's amazing to me. See, the church exists to save souls, but not just to save souls. The church exists to show in the heavenly realms the illustration of God's love and God's purpose. 
You know, the, the purpose of the universe is to glorify God. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. And the purpose of the angels is to praise God. If we look at Psalm 148, it says, Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. But it's when the church, when the church does what it's supposed to do, the angels praise God even more and more. Look at Luke 15, 7. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. When one sinner comes to repentance, the angels rejoice, the heavens rejoice because of what's happening here, because of what's happening in the church. That's amazing to me. That's amazing to me. See, the church enhances angelic praise. When the church worships God, the angels praise God. You know, when the church is doing what it's supposed to be doing, the enemy shrinks back. When the church is worshiping like it's supposed to be worshiping, the enemy shrinks back. When the church is fellowshipping like it's supposed to be fellowshipping, the, angel, the enemy shrinks back. When the church is training disciples like it's supposed to be training disciples, the enemy shrinks back. When the church is doing ministry like it's supposed to be doing ministry, the enemy shrinks back. When the church is evangelizing like it's supposed to be evangelizing, the enemy shrinks back. The church is powerful as a collective body. That's the mystery that was revealed through Jesus Christ that He brought the church. He started the church. It's a powerful force against the enemy. And the next thing is the church has the power to overcome the enemy. You know, from the first time that the believers met at Pentecost to this day, Satan and his demons have tried to destroy the church. The apostles were thrown into prison and murdered, yet the church lived on. The Romans fed Christians to lions, and yet the church lived on. During the Reformation, Christians were burned alive, yet the church lived on. In communist Russia, they made it illegal to own a Bible, and yet the church lives on. In China, where Christians are often arrested and put in prison, yet the church lives on. In Iran, where it is illegal to convert from Islam to Christianity, yet the church lives on and is growing and thriving. More recently, ISIS tried to kill Christians, and yet... In Iraq, the church is growing. Why? Because the church has the power. It has the power. Verse 18 says, Power together with all the saints. Power together with all the saints. See, that's why you can never be an effective Christian by yourself. You cannot fulfill your five purposes by yourself without the church of worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. It takes the collective power of believers to fight the enemy. 2 Corinthians verse chapter 10 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We need each other to be able to do that. We need a collective body to be able to do that. What if one soldier decided to go to Afghanistan and win this war on terror? Oh, I'm going to be Rambo and I'm going to go over there and do it. He wouldn't get very far, would he? It takes a collective effort of a lot of people. See, the enemy is out to destroy you. And you can't fight him by yourself. You need a church. You need other people. Oh, I've heard all the arguments. Well, I don't want to go to church. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I like Jesus, but I don't like church. You know, maybe you're struggling with a sinful habit and you just can't seem to break it. 
You need the church to pray with you. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage. You need the church to pray with you. Maybe you're struggling financially or you're struggling with a health problem. You need the church to pray with you because we're an army. We're an army that's powerful. You can't grow spiritually without the church. See, this is the mystery that unbelievers cannot seem to comprehend. It's the church. Why should I go to church? I believe in God. I'm a pretty good person. Why should I go to church? You know, I even hear people say, well, I believe in Jesus. I just don't like church. That's like, you know, Jesus is the head. The church is his body. That's like saying to Jesus, Jesus, I like your head. I don't like your body. <laughs> Jesus is the, is the bridegroom and the church is his bride. That's like saying to Jesus, you know, Jesus, I like you. I don't like your wife. <laughs> now, granted, the church isn't perfect. The people within the church I should say, are not perfect. None of us are perfect. But we are a force to be reckoned with because we have Jesus as our head. You know, even Satan and his legions of fallen angels didn't see it coming. They didn't see this mystery that was unpacked by Jesus Christ. They thought when they worked with people and they inspired people, they inspired the Pharisees, they inspired the Roman soldiers to take Jesus and to hang him on that cross. They thought we've won. We've done it. We've killed the Son of God. They thought we've won. They didn't understand the rest of the mystery. They didn't understand that three days later he was rising again. They didn't understand that the church was going to start. They didn't understand that this force to be reckoned with was coming out and was going to do some great things around the world. They didn't get it. They didn't get that mystery. Now, my challenge to you this morning, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning when I talked about the building blocks of the temple. You're a building block in this church. My question to you this morning, is, is your part of the wall strong? Is it building up that building or is it crumbling? Where are you at in your life today? Is it strong? What would it take, if it is crumbling, what would it take to make it strong today? What would it take to make it straight? Make a commitment this morning to be a builder be a builder. Let's stand as we pray this morning. Father, I want to thank you for your word today. Thank you, God, for unpacking the mystery for us. You are, you sent your son to be the cornerstone of this mystery of the church. This mystery that we have to spread the truth of your word to the people we come in contact with help us all to be be better building blocks in this thing we call the church help us to lift each other up help us to um, encourage one another to pray for one another to do all the things that you've called us to do god i just want to thank you for this amazing church family and um, all that they do for for each other, for us, for uh, the community, and even around the world. I want to thank you for them. God, you've blessed us in so many ways, and we praise you for that. And uh, God, there's still so much to do, so much work to do, so many people to be reached. And I pray, Father, that you would give us the courage, the courage, the ability, the wisdom to do that. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.